Support for Arkansas Week provided by the Arkansas Democrat Gazette, the Arkansas Times, and KUAR FM 89. Hello, I'm Christina Munoz for Arkansas Week. The state is preparing to spend more than $1 billion in federal funding to expand broadband service and improve the digital skills of residents. We'll talk with an official leading that later in the program. But first, the fight over a proposed casino in Pope County has escalated to the point that Arkansas legislators are asking law enforcement to investigate. During a meeting of the Joint Performance Review Committee, allegations were detailed about threats of violence and intimidation between rival entities vying for gamblers business. Joining me to discuss the situation are two members of the committee. Representative Aaron Pilkington, a Republican from Knoxville, and Representative Carlton Wing, a Republican from North Little Rock. Now, before we delve into what led to the call for an investigation, let's give our viewers some background. In 2018, voters approved an amendment allowing four casinos one in each quarter of the state. Three have since opened in Hot Springs, Pine Bluff, and West Memphis, but the fourth to be located in Russellville remains in limbo. Three years ago, the Arkansas Racing Commission awarded the Pope County license to Gulfside Casino Partnership, which operates casinos in Mississippi. But that was challenged by Cherokee Nation businesses with the state Supreme Court eventually pulling the license. Then in 2021, the Racing Commission voted to award the license to Cherokee Nation businesses. Last year, a group called Fair Play for Arkansas, with the backing of the Choctaw Nation of Oklahoma, sought to put a proposal before voters to remove Pope County as a casino location, but a lack of valid signatures kept that off the ballot. Then in January, Pulaski County Circuit Judge Timothy Fox reversed the 2021 Racing Commission decision, granting a license to Cherokee Nation businesses, which has filed an appeal. That brings us to why we're here today. There's obviously a lot of money at stake, and during your meeting earlier this month, you both heard testimony about threats, intimidation, money being paid to stop canvassers from collecting signatures, and even an allegation of arson. This is a highly complex situation we're talking about. And before we move forward, I do want to mention that we should note that Cherokee Nation is a financial supporter of Arkansas PBS. So first, I want to say thank you to both of you for joining us here today. Thank you for having us. Thank you. Appreciate it very much because this is a complex and confusing mm -hmm. situation we have going on. So first I'm going to go to Representative Wing. Tell us a little bit about this committee meeting that happened, when it was, how long it was, and what your takeaway was. This committee took place a couple of weeks ago. It lasted about three hours and it's all live streamed. Anybody can log on and, and watch what took place. But I think you gave a great detailed summary, but it can be very confusing as mm -hmm. to the, the, the players in and out and all that. The, I think one way to condense it is the citizens of Pope County voted against that initiative back in 2018. They did not want the casino in their county. And so what they were doing was trying to raise enough signatures to put a petition on the ballot so that the rest of Arkansas could exempt Pope County from what they didn't want. So in essence, 74 counties voted to put a casino in Pope County, then the citizens of Pope County did not want that casino. Uh, I believe by the largest margin of no's of any of the other 75 counties. Representative Pilkington represents yeah. part of Pope County. He, mm -hmm. he can speak yeah. to that. So that's a good way to uh, kind of initiate what the problem was initially. And so that was the petition that was being sought, was to get enough signatures. They needed about 90,000 signatures to be able to say, we want to put this to the state please exempt Pope County from this casino. Put it somewhere else, but don't put it in our backyard. And speaking of your backyard, Representative Pilkington, talk about from your perspective what this has been like for you to kind of watch. Well, I always say if you want to ruin a dinner party in Pope County, bring up the casino. Um, <laughs> it's uh, it, it, it really has been an issue that's divided the community. Uh, I represent Johnson County and a portion of Pope County, you know, which even Johnson County approved it. Pope County didn't. You know, I would knock on doors uh, and they, you know, in Pope County and they'd say, we don't want it. And then people in Johnson County say, I can't wait for it to open up. Uh, so it's, it's definitely a, a fraught issue here. 
Obviously, it's it's dragged on. I think casino fatigue is a real issue in, mm -hmm. in Pope County, where you know you have some people just say, "I just I just want it to be done. Courts rule. Please get it over with." But I think you know the reason why we had this committee meeting was because you had a lot of people, a lot of earnest people who were trying to go out and say, you know, we want to make sure that there is that we're getting the casino partner we want, but also making sure that if we do or do not want a casino, that the will of the people is reflected in that. And so, and unfortunately, what you saw was a lot of people who say they claim to care about democracy and the ballot process, you know, all these shady actors descending upon, you know, this quiet town of Russellville and, and causing this kind of havoc and chaos. And so, uh, you know, that was kind of the reason why you, we had this committee meeting, because it is a, you know, it's a sacrosanct uh, thing here in Arkansas, our ballot process. It's, you know, we've got over 100 amendments to our state constitution. <laughs> so I just think um, to, to know that these kind of things are happening, I think it's a, it's a black eye uh, for the area, which didn't, like Representative Wings said, didn't, didn't necessarily want it to begin with, but are now having to deal with the fallout of this. So it's a, it's a contentious issue in the area. And unfortunately, I, I really feel for my constituents and for all of Pope County, even the part I don't represent, because it is just dragged on and on. And then we've had these kind of allegations of things going on that's pitted neighbor against neighbor. And it's just, you just do not want to see that. Absolutely, like he's, the old saying goes, don't talk about politics, don't talk about casinos. I guess that's the yeah. new rule. <laughs> yeah. That's, that's the new rule there. <laughs> where you guys are. So Representative Wing, when we're talking about the legalities of everything that's going on here, is this unique? Has this been an issue before? Talk about those legal ramifications of what we're seeing. Well, and, and you're touching on something that I think is very important in this issue because this is not just a Pope County issue. Uh, all 75 counties need to be paying attention to this process because right now this particular issue is affecting Pope County. It can come to any of the counties because what we're talking about, and one of the reasons why this committee was taking place was to bring and to shed light on the entire process of what happens in the petition gathering uh, process for amending the Constitution of the state of Arkansas. Representative Pilkington aptly mentioned this our Constitution has been amended a hundred times. It's only been in place since 1877. Now the U.S. Constitution has been around for a hundred years longer and has only been amended 27 times. Wow. So we have a history of really changing things a lot constitutionally in the state of Arkansas. We need to look at that process and then what has happened as we look at this particular issue has shed light on the fact that out-of-state actors come in and so what was taking place was a group of citizens of Pope County and citizens of Arkansas who have to file and do everything legally. They're raising, trying to get that signature uh, qualification. There's a group of people trying to block that. Mm -hmm. They are not under the same scrutiny. They don't have to file the same reports. They don't have to do the same things that the petition gatherers do. And we found out, alarmingly, that it's not even illegal for someone to buy the, the, the petitions that have been uh, gathered, somebody can say, I'll give you money to throw those away. Wow. It was mm -hmm. not illegal until recently. We passed that law in the last session. Yep. Now it is, but we were all shocked that it wasn't illegal before. Sometimes you have to have these situations arise so right. that you can make adjustments and changes. Yeah. So it. now we have that in place and in that same law, we also put the petition blockers under the same scrutiny as the petition gatherers so that there's fairness on both sides of an issue. And so that's important. Very good, very good. So um, talk about the investigation, Representative Pilkington, about what's been asked for and why in this particular case. Sure. So what we have is a situation in which a, a, a woman who's a petition gatherer was offered money to throw away uh, the, the signatures. Which that was not gathered, illegal which at was, the time. It was not illegal at the time. But, but, you know, and I would say this, I think most uh, of all our Kansans would think I sign my name on a ballot measure. Uh, it's gonna it's gonna go and get submitted and, and be part of the process. I mean, if you especially if it's something you support, I think you'd be horrified if you realize someone sold your signature essentially. Right. I mean, that's that's horrible. But so this woman was doing that. She was offered money. Uh, there's a recording of her being offered money. Uh, she refused. She believed in what she was doing. Good on her. And then lo and behold, her trailer was later set on fire. Oh. She had to throw her children uh, out the back window. Her and her oh. husband got out. I think the family dog died. Uh, and then, of course, you know, it could have been an accident, but there was an investigation because she had been harassed, because these things had occurred, because you have these shady out-of-state individuals who have come into Arkansas to try to block this, this, this measure. 
and lo and behold, the private investigators showed that there was actually uh, arson, or, or mm. evidence that arson occurred. There was a uh, accelerant around the door where the fire started. So wow. those things are extremely concerning. I think when we think about democracy here in Arkansas, that is like a third world banana republic kind of democracy, not the level that we hold ourselves to. Right. So, uh, and I think that's why we need to investigate and, and, and say that, you know, we're not gonna let these kind of shady actions go without consequences and so that's that I'm happy that we are proceeding with the investigation excellent Go and ahead. I think also it's it's important to note did this alter an outcome I think that's that's a fair mm. question to ask and so we throw out again this group was gathering petitions they were 2,000 signatures away of getting to the next milestone which grants them extra time mm -hmm. to gather more signatures uh, there were 2,000 votes short so how many and, I, and I've got the transcript. Mm -hmm. If it's okay, I, let, sure. me, let, me, sure. let me just share with you. This is an actual transcript. This was in the committee. It was evidence uh, C2 in our committee. It's public record. The uh, person uh, approaches the canvasser, says, throw your petitions in the trash and don't collect another signature. We've done this with other canvassers. The big thing today is that as long as those petitions don't get turned in, now keep in mind, this person offered this canvasser $1,000 for what she was asking her to do, and $700 a week thereafter. Wow. And then uh, don't get these turned in. If there's just any you have at home, like we don't want them, we don't want to see them, we don't nothing, just throw them in the trash. So what Representative Pilkin pointed out, they, these people signed a, a, a ballot initiative thinking my voice is going to count. Mm -hmm. We are going to bring this petition to the voters to be able to decide what to do with, in this case, the Pope County Casino situation. We don't know which signatures didn't, and, and did they get more than 2,000? We know from this, she, she testified right there, she said, we've done this with other canvassers. So did it affect an outcome? Credibly, we could say probably so. And so that thwarts the entire process. We are all about having the people have a voice and we have a process to do this. But in this case, this was done while it technically it wasn't illegal. It is now. Right. But back then it wasn't illegal. It was certainly unethical. And again, that is a transcript of the recording yes. of that conversation. Yes. Mm -hmm. Okay, so sticking with this case and the casino issue in Pope County, what are the next steps that will happen? And do you think it will be, quote unquote, quote, fair with the casino fatigue that you've mentioned, and, and how do we move forward in this particular case? Well, I think on the casino part, I mean, obviously the court is going through the process. I think the license will uh, eventually be given to, to one of the one of the operators, uh, and I think that's going to happen. I think on this, though, it's just holding these, these you know, ballot question committees responsible. Um, you know, I'll, obviously I think there's they're going to investigate, see if people are liable, and try to hold them responsible if they are. What I'd say too, though, is that also I think for us as legislators is we need to go and look at legislation to improve this process. You know, we talked about some of the legislation we already passed, but one of the things I thought was interesting in the committee pro in the committee we had was you had it to where they would just hire these companies, they'd pay them six hundred thousand dollars, and that's one line item on the report. Well, where's all that money going to? That's a lot of money. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, if they said, oh, we spent it all on billboards, okay, that's fine, you can trace and track that, but we don't know where that was going, what they were paying for. There's nothing in the report that says they spent $1,000 to destroy signatures, but clearly in that 600000 that's probably where some of that money was going to. We can, you know, make that assumption. And so, and I would say even both sides during the debate said, you know, yeah, we agree, there should be more transparency on this. Um, and, you know, and I think that's something we as a legislator needs to do is to make sure that there is an ethical standard we're holding these ballot committees to because they don't really, you know, we have caps on how much money we can take in from certain individuals. They don't. Right. Uh, that's crazy, you know, and so, and Unfortunately, I, what scares me is you have these out-of-state groups come in and say, oh man, we can just write a check for $2 million and get ourselves put into the Arkansas Constitution. And that's not right, and that means our democracy is for sale, and that is the last thing we want here in Arkansas. So I think by putting caps on donations, making sure that there's itemized expenses of what you're spending things on, if it's for a contract or for so, so large. And then of course, too, I think a process, you know, we heard things about ballot uh, blockers, you know, harassing people, you know, is, there's no internal investigation within those committees to make sure that they're holding their people responsible. So they can go do whatever and, you know, and we, so they said, well, we investigated it, we asked them about it, and, you know, after a police report was filed. 
And it, it's like, okay, well, did you take that person off the street? Did you do anything? Well, they said they didn't do it, so we were fine. And this, I just think that's just, that's we're literally putting people out into our community to stand out in front of Walmarts, to go to parks, to go by schools, to be around our mothers, children, wives, husbands, whoever. And we don't, and we don't know what these people are saying to people or what they're saying or threatening. And obviously there was some violence that occurred when this happened. And we just, we need processes in place where if people are getting hired, we know that they are doing the work of the people and not doing the bidding of shady out of state entities. Well said. Well, Representative Pilkington and Representative Wing, thank you so much for joining us today. We appreciate you um, contributing to this very complex and very confusing situation. And we thank you for all of that you do as you are uh, leading our state. So thank you very much for your time. You. We appreciate you. And stick around. We'll be right back after this. Arkansas is to receive just over a billion dollars next year from the federal government to expand broadband services. Since the pandemic three years ago showed the importance of people being connected, multiple grants have been awarded to the state. But this could be the last significant funding opportunity to build out the infrastructure, especially to connect rural parts of Arkansas. Overseeing the state's role in this is Glenn Howie, director of the Arkansas State Broadband Office. Thank you so much for being here with us today. Oh, thanks for having me. We very much appreciate all of your insight. So first is a little bit about this money. Uh, when did you kind of know that this was going to be coming to the state of Arkansas? Yeah, this is something that's been building uh, for quite a while. You go back to uh, 21 when the original um, infrastructure bill was passed. Uh, in Congress. So we've known uh, for quite a while now, the last several years, that this money was coming. And as part of the preparations uh, for what we've had to do, especially these last several months, from February uh, to June, our office hit the road, uh, went out and visited all 75 counties, uh, and actually encouraged all of our counties uh, in preparation for this dollar amount uh, to form their own broadband committees and work in collaboration and in partnership with our office. To date, we've had just under 40 uh, counties form broadband committees officially okay. uh, with our office. So we're very uh, happy with that number and look forward to working with those stakeholders. Wonderful. And so let's talk about how big of a problem this is. Many of us are constantly digitally connected, phones, computers, it's everywhere. Absolutely. But when you get into the rural parts of the state, that's not always the case. So how bad is the problem and how do we know that that's the problem? Yeah, look, you know, it's, it's Governor Sanders' vision and our office's mandate to eliminate uh, the digital divide in Arkansas by 2028. And it's really, it's an access issue, it's also an affordability issue, and it's a digital skills issue as okay. well. Now we know um, the access piece or infrastructure piece is foundational to everything that we do. Uh, if you look at the latest release of the FCC's uh, national broadband map, there are still about 215,000 uh, locations, homes and businesses across Arkansas that we still need to connect for the very first time uh, or upgrade because the service that they have is just not standard. So we have a lot of work to do there and that's our number one priority uh, in the administration as it's foundational to everything that we do. Uh, looking beyond that, again, affordability is an issue. So we have mm -hmm. to try as best we can uh, through our grant program and other mechanisms to use free market principles to encourage and foster an environment uh, of affordability and broadband in the state. And lastly, if you look at the digital skills piece or the third pillar of broadband, as we like to frame it now uh, in Arkansas, you know, we think between the traditional working ages of 18 and 64, that there are approximately 274,000 of our fellow Arkansans that may lack basic digital skills. So again, yeah, we're not talking about coding or creating websites. We're saying, take the mouse, go to Google, and apply for a job, right? So we have a lot of work to do as a state across all three pillars, the access piece, uh, the affordability piece, and the digital skills component. But of course, infrastructure and access will always remain the top number one priority. Gosh, it's something when you, you, you really um, almost forget how important it is when we have it because Absolutely. we know how to use a mouse, we know how to use a computer, but when you don't, it can be really mm -hmm. limiting in what people in certain areas are able mm -hmm. to do. Absolutely, look, the, it, it affects everything. It's really kitchen table issues. So uh, whether it's, it's a grandmother down at Hope who needs to see her cancer specialist and will utilize telehealth access to do that, or the rice farmer over in Stuttgart who needs to utilize broadband to increase his crop yields with precision technology, uh, or the student, uh, and Paragold, who no longer has to go to McDonald's, right, to complete his homework and the Wi-Fi there. This touches every aspect of life. 
uh, and we know it is critically important for our state. And just kind of speaking along those lines, we had one example that Arkansas Business shared about um, earlier this week in Green Forest in North Arkansas, where 65 percent of students do not have internet at home compared to students in urban districts, and that could really create an educational disadvantage. Sure, and look, there's been recent uh, studies that have come out in the last, you know, several months that indicate even post the pandemic period how there's a uh, there's been a gap and sort of a drop in the educational attainment uh, around the country. And so we know, um, in, you know, in coordination with that, digital access is critical. Um, it can either set the stage for success or potentially uh, limit the ability to, to make successful uh, endeavors depending on if you have or do not have uh, connectivity. Absolutely. Now, nationally, $42 billion is to be spent through this broadband equity access and deployment program. So how is your office assessing the needs here in Arkansas and the best way to spend the billion dollars that is actually given to that whole state? How are you going to assess the needs and, and break it down? Yeah, absolutely. That's one of the reasons that we, we kicked off this county tour that we did across the state and, and realizing kind of adjusting the conversation just a little bit in the state to think about all three components of broadband, not just the access piece, but also the affordability issue and the digital skills. So we don't have the $1 billion yet, you're correct. We have to do a couple of things to, to get that money. Okay. And one of the things that we have to do to unlock the $1 billion is produce a very robust uh, set of plans for the state of Arkansas. So first, uh, we have to create what's called a digital opportunity plan. If you think about um, programming and other items that are not infrastructure related. So anything extra, if we think about affordability outreach or digital skills training or device programs. So we have to produce a very robust digital opportunity plan by mid-November. And then by the end of the year, uh, the Arkansas State Broadband Office in conjunction uh, with the General Assembly and the administration and our county committees has to produce what's called an initial proposal. And really that describes um, in very, very detailed uh, language the plan for infrastructure build out over the next several years and how we finish this up once and for all. So the rest of 23 is essentially a lot of planning for us to be able to unlock those dollars and then put them into action. And any time, you know, with, gar with regard to state or federal funding, it's mm -hmm. a process Absolutely. and there's a lot of oversight, as there should be. Yeah. So do you, does this plan have to be then approved before funds actually get moved? It does, yeah. Both plans have to be approved. Uh, they'll go to U.S. Commerce and their agency, NTIA, uh, who's responsible for that. We will need to have approval of those plans before we have access to the dollars. Uh, now, U.S. Commerce is not committed to a specific approval timeline. Uh, but we uh, in the Arkansas Broadband Office really anticipate uh, having access to those funds potentially sometime in 24 and be able to begin to run those next infrastructure grant rounds across the state. So we've talked a lot about the three major pillars, mm -hmm. but I'm curious when it comes to the skills, the actual sure. residents using these services, how do you teach and educate those people to help them out? That's a great question. Um, everyone's um, you know, skill level as it relates to digital uh, skills is different. It just depends on the person. You know, some uh, lack basic digital skills and simply need help taking the mouse, going to Google, applying for a job. Uh, you know, my dad would have trouble uh, locating emails and, and game tickets on his phone, right? So it all, right. it depends on the individual person. So uh, ideally, and the things that we're looking at as a state moving forward is to have very sort of flexible digital skills programming that will um, not only adjust to the location that we're trying to teach digital skills, so the, what you try to do in one part of the state may not be what you try to do in another part of the state, just depending upon your population and who you're working with and their interests. Um, so not only being having flexibility in the programming geographically and demographically, uh, but also with the skill set of the individual uh, student as well. So flexibility is going to play a, a big role in our digital skills programming. And I'm curious if you had generational divides, is it mostly the older Arkansans or not? That would be the assumption, but is that what you've been finding? It really spans the, the whole demographic and, and, and all the age groups. You know, you, you would think that it would sort of only be our, our oldest residents <laughs> and, uh, and those folks, but really it does span the entire group. When you look at folks that typically have gone, because there really are existing digital skills programming efforts already happening mm -hmm. across the state uh, through many stakeholders. You look at some of those programs, typically there's, there's a large percentage of attendees from the sort of uh, 30 and under group, and there's also a large amount of attendees with the 60 and over group, so we're still missing sort of that middle huh. middle gap of 30 yeah. to 60 year olds, which we know that that exists as well. 
Um, so really, as we move forward, having a more holistic approach mm. uh, to the digital skills effort will be key. And, and along those lines, assistance is available, but one report said of 72,000 households that are eligible, only 21,000 have enrolled. So that getting the word out there has got to be part of mm -hmm. that struggle as well. How do you kind of plan to yeah. do that? Yeah, you know, the state had done um, a very good job uh, in, in early 2022 with some master planning uh, that went on as part of that process. Uh, there was a, a large survey uh, that happened. and. There were 15,000 respondents to that survey. Mm -hmm. And sometimes one of the often overlooked aspects of some of that data uh, was that only one in 10 uh, individuals responded that they would be even interested in attending sort of an in-person uh, digital skills training class. Okay. So we're gonna have to be innovative mm -hmm. and think about these things a little differently, whether it's um, working with our high school students who need to get some community service hours and working with them to perhaps work with our elderly and more older populations at their at their homes or in um, assisted living facilities and perhaps taking some of this training that needs to happen mm -hmm. and go to people where they are. We may have to look at some of that as well. I think that's a very good option and mm -hmm. the people can get more information at the website www.broadband.arkansas.gov and we've got it up on the screen for you. Thank Absolutely. you so much for sharing your time today with us and telling us Absolutely. all about this. It is a big deal and people need Absolutely. to know about it. Absolutely. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. Appreciate it. And thank you for watching Arkansas Week. Support for Arkansas Week provided by the Arkansas Democrat Gazette, the Arkansas Times, and KUAR. FM 89.